first things first, what is it that spurred you to decide you want to become the president of the Nigeria Football Federation? Thank you very much, Colin. And uh, let me start by thanking you for inviting me uh, for this discussion. And to go quickly in answering your question, uh, my motivation for wanting to be the president of the Nigerian Football Federation uh, was born out of the fact that I sat down uh, and looked at what is happening within our football. And I brought back retrospectively my experience of when I was in the Federation for uh, 11 years, coupled with what I have also been privileged to now see from the vintage position that I currently occupy, uh, which gives me an opportunity to see what is happening within 54 countries, including Nigeria across Africa. And I said to myself that I think I have been through a journey of life that has prepared me for this time in history. I have worked in the NFL for 11 years. I understand the problems of Nigerian football as one that has actually worked in the engine room, which is the office of the general secretary. And I have been privileged to work in CAF and FIFA, seeing how football is being developed across Africa in some countries that we should be matching our shoulders with. And I said, uh, I think I am vintagely positioned to go back home and try and develop an internal football economy. I will tell you sincerely that I became a bit disturbed because I saw that there are some of my colleagues who resigned from CAF and went back to their various countries and got back engaged in the football associations. Some resigned and were engaged in their leagues as staff. Some even resigned in Egypt and were working in clubs. And I asked myself, if today I decide to resign from the NFL, from, the, from CAF, will I be able to go and work in a club in Nigeria? Will I be able to go and work in the league regulatory body in Nigeria? So, and I said, I think at this point in my life, with what I have been able to pass through and understudy, I feel I can contribute in making sure that we develop this internal football economy that I'm talking about, where opportunities of this nature that I've just mentioned will be available for people uh, to contribute their skills and uh, expertise in their countries. And this was why I felt that I, I should come in, you know, uh, and throw in my heart in the ring and uh, contest for this position. You, you talked about having worked with the Federation for 11 years. But you are still employed by the Federation, aren't you? Of course, yes. I am still a staff of Nigerian Football Federation, but I'm currently on leave of absence without pay. Uh, don't forget that in the Football Federation, as of today, we have two sets of staffs, those that are employed by the federal government and those that are contract staffs. I am under the category of those employed by the federal government. And by the civil service regulations, you are entitled to apply for leave of absence uh, without pay if your organization also considers that what you are going to do has a benefit to the organization. In which case, uh, in my case, I am going to a, a continental body that is regulating football. What has been the response? Uh, and, and I'm asking that question on two fronts. One, from let's say people like me, the, the man on the street, and then two from the people who are the actual voters, the delegates who will vote in that election? Well, it started out as a shock to a lot of key football stakeholders. And I'm certain that you are also one of such people who probably would have been surprised to see a Christian Emerua, uh, whom everyone probably had their the mindset of what he should stand for, probably just a technocrat facing his job in, uh, in Cairo, and uh, now coming out to say he wants to fight to become the president of Nigerian Football Federation. 
Uh, so yeah, to a lot of people, they they felt shocked, but not uh, totally surprised. And uh, they also had the feeling that um, with the pedigree that I am bringing on board, um, that it is something that is worth welcoming, uh, as a lot of them that I have had the cost to interact with were all of the opinion that they really would need a fresh breath, a fresh idea, a fresh outlook of Nigerian football. And to the general public, I would say that the Nigerian public has been very, very overwhelming. Uh, the, the, the encouragement, the support, the welcoming of the idea of what you call the new, the new kid on the block, you know, uh, has been quite overwhelming and humbling too. Uh, it has also revealed to me um, that whatever you do in life, people are watching. People are watching and observing you. And at certain points, people will comment about what they consider to be what you have been doing. And this to me was one of the key uh, humbling experience that this declaration has brought uh, to the fore. Uh, so I would say that um, amongst the stakeholders, it's been well received. Um, and among the Nigerian populace, it is still a matter of discussion. Uh, and so far, it has been all positive. Of course, uh, we also have people who have their fears, wondering why I would want to leave my job and come back home. Uh, I had someone who once told me that uh, people are trying to leave the country and you are thinking of coming back to the country. What is it that Chris Emirwa brings to the office of NFF president that will be significantly different from what we've seen in the past? First and foremost, what I am bringing is something that nobody ever in the history of Nigerian football uh, would be bringing or has brought uh, in time past. We have never had anyone that has worked in the Nigerian Football Federation that has also been privileged to study sports management up to a PhD level, that has also been privileged to work with FIFA and CAF at the same time, uh, contesting to be the president of the Nigerian Football Federation. So uh, for me, I feel that I am bringing something that is unique in the sense that I understand the internal workings of Nigerian Football Federation. This is something I have done for 11 years of my life. I also understand the critical challenges that is currently faced by Nigerian Football Federation. And also, I have also been able to identify where we can get the necessary help and support that can fix some of the major challenges that we have. And I'll give you just a simple uh, uh, analogy of what I'm talking about. Um, we have a very huge deficit in terms of capacity development within the Nigerian football ecosystem. And this deficit is cut across all boards, all areas. And to be honest with you, if we want to move our football uh, internal ecosystem uh, to the next level, we need to also develop capacity of the people that are involved in the organization of our football. And this, it's part of what I believe that I have the expertise and the necessary links to be able to bring those that can support us in these areas. Apart from that, uh, for you to work in Nigerian Football Federation and lead the Nigerian Football Federation, you must have a deep understanding of the challenges in Nigerian Football Federation. And for one that has worked in the office of the Secretary General, uh, serving three of them, at different times and also understanding the strengths and weaknesses of the staff themselves because they are critical stakeholders in all that we talk about um, as well as the challenges that is currently being faced by state football associations as well as other uh, members of the Nigerian Football Federation family I feel strongly that I have what it takes you know to be able to lead our football um, away from where it is currently in terms of the internal football economy. Um, and I'm saying this without, without sense of humility because 
we need at this stage in our football history, not just a president by nomenclature, but somebody with the expertise, with the knowledge of what to do. And, and I believe that I have this expertise and this knowledge of what to do and how to do it and when to do it. Uh, and this is what I'm bringing to the table, you know, and this is the same story I've been telling to the stakeholders that I am bringing to the table a new way and a new manner in which we can use to develop our football, which we know have been tested and trusted in other clients and has been made to be successful. And we have this knowledge, we have this information, and we also know how these things can be done, you know. Uh, and this is basically for me, part of the reasons why I felt that I needed to come out to become, uh, to vie for this position. Don't you think that one, that puts you at a disadvantage in terms of, you have this former FA chairman who came in there, they saw you as um, somebody who worked under the general secretary, and now you want to come and be the man leading them. So um, it, it, doesn't that take a real 180 mindset change from them to be able to reconcile that Christian Emiro with this Christian Emiro who wants to be NFF president? And the second question um, I'll ask you, I mean, if you forget that what I'll ask you again is, the office of the general secretary is the actual engine room running the federation. So why not, if you really want to make a lasting change, have, have you thought about, okay, why don't I go and become the general secretary where I can actually effect more process changes within the federation than becoming the president? Thank you very much. Uh, yes, of course, a lot of people will say he's a small boy. We know when he joined. The <laughs> but he's a small boy, uh, we know. I mean, even I would say he's a small boy. <laughs> uh, we, we know when he joined the FPA, we, is he not that boy that was carrying bag for the general secretary or is he not that boy that was answering phone for the general secretary. And of course, yes, I, I would say that yes, to a lot of them, I am a small boy and I will still remain a small boy even if I become the president. There is no doubt about that. But the fact here is that the young shall grow and the young has grown and the young is now mature to be able to He's say- young with that, all, those, uh, all those white beards. Well, <laughs> I, I think this, these are all the evidence of, uh, <laughs> of the stress we are passing through at the continental. Uh, uh, and, and what I'm saying in essence is, is, is the fact that, look, I joined the NFF with a, with a master's degree and I was running off my PhD by the time I came into the NFF. And everyone who had any association with me would be able to tell that my work ethics was clear enough to indicate to them that this young man knows what he's doing in this industry. And I was in the same NFF when I got selected by FIFA to be part of the FIFA safety and security team. And I tell you that it was also because of what I was doing in NFF that gave me this opportunity to work with a global body. I was working in NFF while I was still working with FIFA. I did four different World Cups with FIFA, while, in fact, five, uh, including the last FIFA World Cup in Russia, you know, where I was the first African and the first black man to ever be responsible for a FIFA World Cup final venue in charge of security as the head of security for that venue. So for those who know my history, they will tell you that there has been a consistent progression in my life. And I'm not just saying this because of any other thing. I have not remained stagnant at any point of my career. My career has enjoyed steady growth and personal development. I am among the very first, <clears throat> in fact, I'm the first African that is a certified sports safety and security professional in the world till today. And this was a course I did in Germany for one year while I was still working in Nigerian Football Federation. So I, I knew where I was going. And I, I worked my way diligently towards attaining all the necessary um, um, professional training that could equip me, making me what I am today. The job I'm doing currently in CAP uh, is a job that has never been in existence in the history of African football in over 60 years, which is to start off the safety and security department from scratch. And today, as I speak to you, we started the department in 2019, February. We are the second best in the world apart from UEFA. And this is all achieved within three years. So it's something that is verifiable about what this young boy who was 
carrying bag for general secretary. Russian, small boy, not young boy. Yeah, yeah, small boy. I'm still a small boy to school. <laughs> I will remain as I continue to say. On the other aspect about the office of the general secretary and why I have not aspired to at least become the chief administrating officer in the football house. I told someone recently, I said, listen, I served three general secretaries. I started my career in that office and I, I would say I ended it in that office. I saw the challenges that had been faced by these general secretaries at different times. And I can tell you the limitations of the powers of the general secretary. There is no office that is more frustrating than that of the general secretary especially when you're a general secretary that have ideas that you want to implement. And I would tell you, I saw my three bosses being frustrated at different times. I could feel their pains, I could feel their anger, but because they do not have the executive powers, they were limited to what they could do. Even when you write excellent memos, you present it, it still has to take the executive power to make it work. And a lot of things that happened in the past, I must say, were preventable and were foreseen by that office, but for some political reasons, were frustrated. And this is why I said, I will not go through another round of frustration in my life to become a general secretary. After I have served there for 11 years, and I know that at three different eras, they had different experiences of frustrations. That I want to be on the driver's seat because I have a clear vision of what I want to achieve with Nigerian Football Federation. And my vision is clear to take Nigerian Football Federation and make it an institution where people from over the world will come and say, oh, can this work in Nigeria? Today, we are celebrating what we have achieved in CAF, Safety and Security Department which has opened the way for CAF today to be among those that has a voice amongst the committee of nations in the world, among the committee of institutions in the world. We are part of the United Nations Office of Counterterrorism for major sports events uh, security. We were part of those who contributed to the development of the first document of major sports security in the world. You know, we are part of the uh, project uh, Stadia, Interpol project Stadia. We are part of the uh, WHO intervention program for mass gathering. All this simply because we have been able to show that yes, we are from Africa, but we have excellence to present to the world. And today we are also proud to say between 2019 and now, as I speak to you, we have been able to have Africans. I was the only security officer at some point in, in FIFA, but today we have been able to produce Africans that are able to also transmute their, uh, their knowledge into becoming FIFA security officers. We inherited a system whereby we did not even have security officers that we can call competently trained security officers in Africa. But today, as I speak to you, the department has been able to empower over 670 people across the continent of Africa. As we speak today, we have also entered into partnership with the International Center for Sports Security, as well as UNITA to float an online certified training on safety and security, specifically for football safety and security in Africa, giving Africans the opportunity to be able to learn online at their own pace and get certified. These are things that are there for anyone to check from a department that was never in existence in the last three years to a department that is the second best rated in the world within three years. And we wrote the first safety and security regulation in the continent. And this safety and security regulation can be taken to anywhere in the world and be comparable to anything that you want to talk about as far as safety and security is concerned. And we are not stopping there. We are also continuing you know, in, in, this, in this quest to make sure that the safety and security department of CAF gets to a point where we, because this is my dream, we will export expertise to other continents to support them. As we speak today, we started, as I told you, without having enough personnel. Now, within one year, between 2019 and 2020, we're able to train 18 trainee trainers 
that are now able to produce, to train 326 club safety and security officers across Africa. This is Africans empowering Africans. From when we started in 2019, I had to invite all my foreign friends, 11 of them, for the first training. In 2021, we were having a training and we noticed that we only had one person from Europe that was part of us, while 18 were Africans. So, and this is the idea. We definitely know that there is a whole lot that Nigerian football can do for Nigerians as a people and also for the economy of Nigeria. But what is missing is the structure that can be able to process all these raw materials that we have in our country. We want to create a system where I look forward to creating a system where a child who has a dream to play football would have a system that can identify this child from the school or from the streets. Right. I was actually coming to that, Christopher, because I, it's very important to get into yeah. the real, because when you talk about running for president of the federation, you want to want to develop football and not just develop football. You want to develop football in the, the, the whole 360 economy, which is what you've mentioned. Develop the game, develop the business, develop the facilities, the infrastructure, uh, and then develop the people at the same time. So all of that work together. And that's where I was coming to. So I hope, I hope that's where you're trying to learn. So what plans do you have, you know, to do all of these things, you know, the game, the players, the people, the facilities, infrastructure, processes, governance, all of that? Look, it's a whole lot of work to be done. Um, there's no doubt about it. Uh, the, the, the job of the president of the Nigerian Football Federation is a whole lot of work, especially uh, the current state that we are in Nigeria. We are going, or I am going, I like using we because I don't believe in working alone, yeah? <laughs> so it's a team. Uh, it's about leadership, bro. <laughs> <laughs> it's a team. So we have we have plans to make sure that one, for example, we are able to get back football to the grassroots. We need to get back football to the schools. We need to get back football to our states. We need to get back football to the local governments. We need to get football back to the regional level and also to the national level. If you check, my dear friend, you will understand that the, the, the NFF have been concentrating more on international qualif qualifications with, with national teams, which of course is also one of our key mandates, you know, to make sure that we have good teams that represents Nigeria for international competitions. But the crux of the matter here is that we need to continue to feed those teams. Sorry. <laughs> Never have taken uh, Nepa has taken that, but I think it's going to come to. <laughs> yeah, 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 off Nepa, we are back. Yeah, we are back. <laughs> so as I was saying, uh, we, we, we need to get we need to get it right. Um, we we are not going to do this alone. We will partner with various institutions that are already doing what we want to do, but we will only help them to get it in a properly organized manner. Um, Colin, as I said, taking football back to the schools is a developmental project that has to be done in all our schools across Nigeria. Taking football back to the state's football associations where we can have state championships, state tournaments, state leagues. These are things that we will need to also assist the states to develop their capacity. You mentioned an all around 360 thing. We cannot just say, okay, states organize your league. We know that they, they lack the capacity. So we are bringing people that will be able to train, that will be able to help, to support. We also know that when we say we are taking football back to the schools, we cannot just say, hey, we throw footballs to you and then you play. No, we have to also support first and foremost to check how many schools have physical education teachers. If they don't have physical education teachers, how many states Sports Commission has football coaches, grassroots football coaches. How many local government sports councils have football grassroots coaches? What is the training of these football grassroots coaches? Can we engage them on a part-time basis to support our project? 
to support these children in schools? And how can we be able to engage them if we do not expose them to certain levels of training? And this is where the capacity building comes in. Because we are not going to expose our children to a system whereby they will not be able to get the best of training uh, when they want to play football, because this is where the basics are all starting from. Secondly, you talk about infrastructure. Yes, we need to get infrastructures. We need to get things in place. And how do we get things in place? We get things in place starting from even, let me start by saying that, what do we really need for football? We need a pitch, a green pitch, and two posts, and football will be played. So why can't we invest in a program that can help us to get football pitches developed in our schools, developed in our loop? If we don't have these programs applied, there's no way we can be able to say we want to run with them, okay? And then secondly, we now talk about the organizers themselves. The people that we call, for example, the secretaries of state football associations today, these are the chief organizers of all competitions in the states. Between me and you, in the last 30 years, these gentlemen and ladies have not been trained in any form of football administration or in any form of football organization. Some of them left university some 20 years ago as graduates of physical education, and sport has moved on. So we need to begin by also developing the capacity of these guys, uh, these ladies, so that they can also understand what it is to be done. And not only that, again, don't forget, we also need to look at the officials, the officiating officials. What is the program that we have in Nigeria for referees across Nigeria from the state level? We know we have these structures. These structures that they are but how can we support this structure? But not the least is to say again, how do we implement our rules? How do we implement our rules? Because football is governed by rules. If you don't implement the rules the way it should be, then there is nothing we are talking about. We can't get any results. Again, as I said to a lot of people, we, we also need to be able to show the sincerity, the honesty, and transparency that is required to build confidence in the entire ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Someone was asking me today that, you know, football requires money. How will you get money to do all these things you are talking about? And I said to him, I said, the first thing that you need to do before you get a tenant is to build the house. <laughs> we have not been able and in building the house, we need to mold the foundation. We need to put the pillars. We need to put the blocks. We need to make sure that we get it to the roofing and make sure that our house is ready. Then we can put it out for rent. But you cannot say, come and rent my house when there's even no house for anybody to rent. And all well, I'm coming to well, do- Please don't forget, in Nigeria, we have landlords who will tell you, oh, my house is not complete. Pay, I, will use, I will use the money and complete it and you can move. <laughs> I, be, I talk like Yes, <laughs> you don't talk like but the fact is that, you know, at least the man has started something, okay? And uh, there is a place for that person to pack his load into, not just a bare land where you have not actually started anything. Mm -hmm. and, and this for me is why I, I feel strongly that my, my skill set comes into play because I am coming from a technocrat point of view, which is a hands-on person not uh, not a politically driven person, a hands-on person, a man who knows that he has to write to live, to make a living. He has to plan, he has to work on budget to make a living. And this is where my expertise comes in. And this is where we will also be ready to collaborate and help and support uh, the stakeholders critically. And uh, as they say, even in my organization where I work today, at the end of the year, they will ask you, what have you saved for the organization? Yes, you have a budget. Yes, but you must save something for the organization. So we also, we have to take a look at where we, we are spending money where it's not possibly necessary. And we divert it to where it is mostly uh, necessary for us to get good results. Yep. <clears throat> and which brings me, I'm trying to keep this down to, 
as so we don't we don't um take up too much of your time i don't spend up to an hour so now i guess we know the perception of what the <clears throat> excuse me the NFS suffers from a perception of a lack of trust and people thinking that the place is a den of corruption and of course you know when you push corruption corruption will push back at you you know so how do you intend as if you get elected NFF president to clear that perception of mistrust and if there's any pushback from within how do you fight that pushback the the, the first thing um Colin is is that we 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 must have clear sincerity of purpose okay um i cannot as i always tell people that there is no man that does not like money but every reasonable man must be guided by certain principles of life okay i have always been guided by the principle that money will come but i have to work for it money will come i have to work for it I used to jokingly tell some of my friends that if I wanted money hurriedly, I would have joined my brothers in Alaba to be selling things. <laughs> but I decided to spend 11 years of my life, or uh, I'm talking of 11 years, 16 years of my life in the academy, in the walls of the university, uh, which shows you that there was a different agenda that I was pursuing. Okay. And I would have preferred Alaba. Those who, just, out of, just to be clear, I would have preferred Alaba. I also, well, I, I personally do not think that I need so much money in this life because, <laughs> I mean, I can't live more than one space of the bed and I cannot eat more than a meal at a given time. So um, the truth of the matter is that we understand that, yes, corruption fights back. Again, it comes back to what are the strategies that you are putting in place to fight corruption. If you are transparent, if you are open, if you are accountable, Colin, if I become the president of the Nigerian Football Federation today, I will make available the accounts of this federation to the public. So if you make this available to the public, those who possibly uh, have their own intentions uh, will understand that it's not business as usual. The truth of the matter is that Nigeria must be made to work in one way or the other. And as I have told a lot of people, I'm not coming out as a do or die to the president of Nigerian Football Federation. I am coming out because I want to provide service. And it is not compulsory that I must be president if God does not say I will be president. But if God says I'll be president, no matter what anybody does, I will be president. And I would come as I have always been, honest, transparent, and open. Honest, transparent, and open. This is what has taken me to where I am today. I did not get to where I am by recommendation of anybody or political push. No, it's by my sheer hard work and professionalism. Between 2019 and 2021, I was able to raise from FIFA Forward Fund over $1 million from my various projects. And it was clearly accounted for, clearly accounted for. And I know you also don't know this. I was a student union president of Adeyemi College of Education. I was the first student union president that audited the account of the student union government before I left office. The records are there. It's not something I'm saying now. This was something that happened as far back as 1999. So if those who had worked with me can also be asked, they will also tell you because everybody has worked with me at some point or the other within the course of my journey in Nigerian football. They will tell you that where I stand when it comes to accountability, transparency, and honesty. And I'm not using it to blow my trumpet. I'm only saying that what will come to a man as his blessing, and this is what I believe, I'm a Christian, I believe it strongly, that the blessing of God is without bitterness. I don't need to acquire wealth 
in a filthy way. I need to be able to sleep with my two eyes closed. And this is what has been my guiding principle in all the things I do. And I'm grateful to God today that I am seeing the blessings, at least within the confines of what I need. And this is the same thing that I'm going to bring on board. And I'll say it again. Whatever is meant to be spent for Nigerian football will be dispensed for Nigerian football. This is what I am telling every stakeholder. Not just being dispensed. Everyone that is in football and that has interest in football, we know what we are making and what we are using it for. I don't know how hard this can be for, for anybody you know, to make available. There's nothing confidential. If I become president, I don't have any confidential confidentiality clause. So I will tell you if I get one naira that I have gotten one naira. And we are using this one naira to organize 10 coaches training across Nigeria. And this is what each coaching training is going to cost. Are you getting what I'm saying? So yep. this is gotcha. something that personally, I mean, I, I have worked, I have seen how the international organizations operate in terms of transparency, accountability. I have been in CAF during the period of revolution and uh, restructuring. Uh, we have seen a lot of restructuring and I cannot come all the way from there because I want to now come and uh, line my pockets or do some shady deeds to destroy my reputation. I have a name to protect, you know? I have a name and a, car and, and a career that I have built over the years, uh, which I need to protect. And this for me is also one of the reasons why I really would want to be the president because I need to show to people that one sector of my country can effectively work well. Mm -hmm. And this is basically what we are saying. Okay. You know. How do you intend to overcome that hurdle and, and, and beat this heavyweight in your bid to become NFF president? Because it's not just about the vision you have, it's also about your political savvy within the voting delegates. Well, um, one thing I can tell you is that I have been engaging all the stakeholders. I have engaged them personally. I have engaged them individually and collectively. I would still continue to engage them to the election day. And as you know, that I mentioned earlier, that for me, it is God that make get one a king. I would only do my best as human to convince people that I have something to offer. If it pleases God that I become the president, he will make it happen. But I will not go beyond what I can do, which is to explain my programs as I've tried to do to you today, to try and convince them that we can do much more than what is currently on ground which everyone will be beneficial to, to what the outcomes will be. And to also say that I am available to provide this leadership. Every other thing, my brother, I believe I'm for the hand of God. <laughs> if True. it is his will that I become president, I will. And let me tell you, everyone I have gone to meet, those that are contesting, I have also told them that I am not coming to deter you from contesting. If you find out from them, all those I have met and they told me they also have the intention to contest, I said, please do contest. So I am not telling anybody not to contest. And I'm also encouraging others to please come out and contest. For me, my intention to come and contest, I will continue to explain what I can do if given the opportunity. And if it happens that, as I said, God says it is my time and his will, then I will become the president. So I'm not looking at big weights or heavy weights or no heavy weights. I'm only looking at the will of God. <laughs> <do it>. <laughs> and uh, God my, ability, my ability to, <laughs> to convince people of what I can offer. This is all I'm looking at. So I'm not distracted by the heavyweights. I know they are heavyweights. And I also tell them that I know they are heavyweights. <laughs> <laughs> I know they are, some of them have been heavyweights for 20 something years. You know? so, 
just tell them that I know they are heavyweights, but that, that's a very just, good backhand. <laughs> yeah, well, just know that the the small boy you sent out to go and learn has has graduated. He now wants to come back and uh, show, show working. This is 